Coming up, archaeologists believe they may have uncovered the house of the prophet Elisha, and Christian leaders from around the world experience Israel for the first time. Well, welcome to 700 Club Canada. Bill, are you a runner? Uh, used to be. Used to be. The knees said no. The knees yeah. are starting to go, yeah, pounding on pavement, not so good. You know, I'm actually <laughs> questioned if it is actually good for you. Not that that's my biggest excuse, but my knee too. But lately I ran our cottage road. Like I have a uh, walk that okay. I do is quite hilly and I ran two thirds of it, Bill. I was proud of myself. You, I'm not saying I'm going to keep it up. But. You should be. Uh, well, I'm actually thinking of picking up pickleball. It's, you know, a bit of useless information for all of you. It is the <laughs> fastest growing sport in North America. Yes. So I think I'm going to try that. It's fantastic, by the way. Okay. I love it. Okay. And at the gym that I go to, they've just redone the whole soccer area for pickleball. Well, our whole auditorium now is going to have pickleball lines in it. So wow. that's pretty cool. Come to church, play pickleball. pickleball. I mean, maybe a new thing. Well, up first, <laughs> there's 40,000 participants that lace up their running shoes and embark on an exhilarating marathon through the historic streets of Jerusalem. That sounds fun. I know. 40,000 participants took part in this year's Jerusalem Winter Marathon and other races. That's 10,000 more than have ever joined in the annual event. It's the 12th marathon and we are very excited to start the marathon. And you know, it's after the COVID and it's something very special for us. Jerusalem Mayor Moshe Leon says the marathon is more than a sporting event. You might be running 42 kilometers but you're also running through 3,000 years of history. Leon and his wife also took part in the 10K. Among the athletes, 2,700 runners from more than 70 countries came up to Jerusalem to take part. Runners from Kenya won both the men's and women's marathon. The races take runners past iconic sites like the Tower of David, the old city walls, and Jaffa Gate. I'm just trying to spread the peace, the love between everybody, regardless about what you believe, regardless about your color, regardless about your religion. Jerusalem is a special city with the running and without the running. <laughs> so you're welcome to visit, and especially in the marathon. It's a beautiful city. I just want to start it and finish it, <laughs> but I'm very, very excited. There are six races, including a marathon, half marathon, 10 kilometer, five kilometer, a family race and a community race. And I've been running the marathon since it began here, the Jerusalem Marathon. And this is my grandson. Yeah, Iftati. And this is Say my hello. son. Hi, hi. We're continuing the tradition for the next 50 years. Amen. Because Amen. now it's my 70th birthday. The full marathon is one of the most challenging in the world because the city is very hilly. I'm hoping to finish without like hurting myself and you know, it's my first marathon, so so yeah, it should be good. I'm, I'm looking forward. One couple even ran on their honeymoon. We just got married on Tuesday. Oh! <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, and we, we keep running and running and running. <laughs> That's all we do. <laughs> Everything's great. It's beautiful to be here. Jerusalem is already preparing for next year, and registration is open for the marathon that's unique in all the world. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, good for them, right? I can't imagine running 42 kilometers, I'm just saying. Yet alone up a lot of hills. Like Jerusalem is this spectacular city, but it's very hilly. You know, this is actually, though, a really great picture of the unity of people, right? All sharing a common goal. There's enthusiasm around that. And simply their goal is to finish that race, whatever race they pick, the short one or the longer one. But notice that they didn't all run that same race. Some did run the 42 kilometers while others ran shorter races. I know that's what I would pick. So young and old alike, it's just so uh, such a great picture of how life can be. And scripture often refers to our life as a race too. In fact, in Hebrews uh, 12 verse one, it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Boy, this verse is powerful. I mean, here's a few lessons that we can learn. First of all, 
throw off or get rid of anything in your life that's holding you back, right? I mean, it can be sin itself or it just can be unhealthy habits or unhealthy relationships, even bad attitudes. Like throw those things off, get rid of them and start running the race with perseverance. Start living your life with perseverance. Sometimes I think we hold on to things that hold us back because we just don't have the tenacity or perseverance to let go of them, right? And to create new habits. So perseverance is important. And notice also, it reminds us, run your own race. Don't run someone else's race. Stop comparing to the guy who can run 42 kilometers when you can only do five. Run your race with perseverance. God is cheering you on and you find other people who will too. Why don't you call us today at one 759 700 so we can cheer you on. Well, after the break, have archaeologists found the biblical prophet Elisha's house? See this amazing discovery when we return. This is Tel Rehov in the Jordan Valley. During 16 years of digging, archaeologists uncovered a 3,000-year-old, well-planned city. They also found a unique building that might have been the house of Elisha. The house was full with objects of unique type. Two altars we found there, two pottery altars that were used for uh, burning incense. Lead archaeologist Ami Mazar also points out the difference in the structure of the house. Normally houses have one entrance leading to, into a large space with rooms all around. This house was divided into two wings. The two wings were connected to one another through the back room. And each one of the wings had an opening towards the street. Outside the room were incense altars, maybe used to make an offering to God, before entering to hear the prophet's message. During the excavation, archaeologists discovered this special room inside the house with a table and a bench inside. They also discovered a pottery shard with the name Elisha on it, dated to the ninth century, which leads some to believe this was the room of the prophet Elisha. We found a ink inscription written in red ink on pottery. It's broken, unfortunately, but we reconstruct the name as Elisha. Elisha was born about seven miles from Tel Rehov in Avel Mahola and went throughout the kingdom of Israel from Jericho to Samaria to Shunam. I cannot say for sure that this particular Elisha that we found is the biblical Elisha. You know, it's very difficult to say, but it's very tempting because it's exactly the period when Elisha acted, the second half of the ninth century BC. Elisha the prophet was known for telling the widow to borrow empty pots fill them with a tiny cruise of oil, and sell them to pay her creditors, raising the Shunammite son from the dead and instructing the Syrian army commander Naaman to wash in the Jordan River seven times to be healed of leprosy. Archaeologist Stephen Fawn calls the evidence compelling. With only six other people by the name of Elisha known in that time for a couple of centuries on either side, we can somehow believe that either there was just the luck that this holy man was also by the name of Elisha, or this was Elisha the prophet himself. Another discovery pointing to Elisha is the discovery of two different inscriptions mentioning the family of Nimshi. Remember, it was Elijah that was told to an anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be king. He passed that on to Elisha, who sent out one of his disciples to finally do the anointing. Many archaeologists shy away from drawing conclusions about the Bible, but some see it as a way of putting the pieces together. Archaeology is like a huge puzzle, you know. We, we add information from one excavation, a second excavation, a third excavation, Chatzor, Megiddo, Tel Rehov, Bet She'an, Samaria, and together we bring it in into a large picture, the large puzzle, trying to decipher the material culture of the Israelites. For Carrie Summers, who heads Nazareth Village, 
it's even more. It's like any other uh, archaeological site, in, in essence, is every scoop of dirt proves the Bible one scoop at a time, and this site is absolutely magnificent. The future of the site is uncertain because its mud bricks are deteriorating. Experts hope, however, it can be preserved to help future generations understand the Bible. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Tel Rehov, Israel. One of my favorite stories about the prophet Elisha is when the king of Aram sends an army to kill the prophet. And the reason he sends it is because Elisha keeps predicting the movements of the enemy <laughs> against Israel, so Israel is always a step ahead. And so when the army comes, Elisha's servant panics because he can only see with physical eyes. All he sees is this massive army surrounding them, and they are grossly outnumbered. But in 2 Kings 6, verse 16, Elisha says, don't be afraid. And I actually think he wants to say that to you and I today. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I love how this story ends. The, the servant's eyes are open. He sees, yes, God is greater than any enemy obstacle we face. And as a result, the enemy that came to kill Elisha, they are blinded. God blinds them. Here's what you need to know about your life. If you trust God, if you're willing to see this world the way he sees it, he will thwart the plan of the enemy. And as a result of this, bring them into captivity. So maybe today, you feel like you're surrounded by an enemy. May God open your eyes to the truth that if God is for us, no one can be against us. And if you need some faith in your life, I wanna encourage you to call us at 1-855-759-0700. We have this great resource entitled Faith, and we wanna pray with you that God would open your eyes because I know it's tempting to see only with physical eyes and be overwhelmed. But faith opens our spiritual eyes to see that God is greater. He is going to win in your life if you trust him. Well, up next, pastors and leaders from around the world embark on their first ever visit to Israel. I don't think there's anything more crucial in this hour than to connect Christian leaders to biblical literacy and where better for the Bible to come alive than in the land of the Bible. When we walk here and we meet Jesus, the Jew, in his context, all of a sudden we understand the covenantal continuity of God from Abraham to Isaiah to David to Jesus to Paul to the nations of the earth. Connecting believing Christians to Israel is paramount to strengthening, defining, and expanding our faith. The experience makes an impact. It's been really amazing because being reading the Bible most of my life and then actually seeing the place where everything happened and walking the same places that Jesus went, it makes everything so much more real. It's amazing. I think that it's wild to see the biblical narrative just come to life. And I think one of the biggest scenes that just caught my attention is after close to 2,000 years, the Jews being gone and how God's faithfulness brought them back. As a South African, seeing New South Africa and what God has done in our country, I just felt like this experience here gave me so much hope. I think it's important. You know, it's such a key controversial topic across the nations. Mm -hmm. And so for us to get on the ground, listen to the different stories, all the different perspectives is so wonderful. For so many pastors and leaders, going to the Holy Land is a bucket list item that too many times they don't fulfill till they're in their 60s or their 70s towards the end of their ministry. When we're able to identify young leaders who are on an upward trajectory of their ministry and bring them into alignment with what God is doing in this land, the modern day miracle of the people and land of Israel, that takes that experience and allows it to expand in their own sphere of influence. 
68% of the leaders we have brought to the land of Israel for the first time have brought back a group from their church within 12 months. So we're exponentially increasing connection to the land by investing in the lives of young leaders. Stearns believes a first-hand experience allows visitors to see beyond bias and hopeless headlines. I think the impact is that the mainstream media loves to blow things out of proportion and create false narratives. When people come to the land and they see the incredible peaceful coexistence that's happening on the ground between Jews and Christians and Muslims and Arabs and Druze and the complexity of the land here and yet the great harmony that we see most of the time day by day. You begin to deconstruct um, the fake news. You begin to deconstruct the false narrative and there's a lot of hope that comes, right? The, the national anthem of Israel, Hatikva. There's a lot of hope that begins to come that praying for the peace of Jerusalem is not just a metaphorical idea but it's a reality if we will add our strength and our work toward that prayer. Another of Stern's efforts complements his ministry of bringing global leaders to Israel. I want to continue to invite the nations of the earth to set aside the first Sunday of every October as the global day of prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. The body of Christ worldwide just lost our patriarch, Pastor Jack Hayford, who was my co-chairman in this. He was with me, with Pat Robertson, when we launched this in 2004 in the Rose Garden of the Knesset. And uh, by God's grace, it has spread now to 172 nations, our materials in 29 languages around the world. So I invite the global body of Christ to set aside the first Sunday of every October to fulfill our biblical mandate to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. When there's peace in Jerusalem, there will be peace on planet Earth, and we will see the return of Messiah. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. You know, Lori, whenever I think about Israel, I'm reminded that it was the center, the epicenter, the beginning, the origin of our faith, yeah. uh, not just geographically and nationally, but spiritually. When on the day of Pentecost, it says, uh, when Jesus said, you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses. And it would start in Jerusalem, yeah. but it would go to Judea and then Samaria, the place no one wanted to go if you're a Jew, and then to the ends of the earth. And we see that in our day today. Yeah. And that word witness is the a Greek word martus, uh, where we get our English word martyr. And often we think it means you have to die for your faith. It doesn't really. We, that was just someone who had seen with their own eyes yeah. and was a witness. And so yeah. I think about that. I think about how those who saw Jesus, experienced him, yeah. saw him die and rise again, were witnesses. And it's a faith we hold on still today. I'll never forget being there, Bill, and going into the upper room. They're very confident this was a place that the disciples gathered. Mm. There was something that was powerful about being in that room. And for me, the visual and the experience of being there and not only imagine Jesus with his disciples mm. there, but look at the truth and the power of the gospel to be shared all over the world. Like this really motley crew of, you know, men were... The, the power is in the testimony of God through people, through generation after generation, like it has spread all over the world, you know? And just the power of that, I was like, man, who would have thought? They would have never have thought that in their moment of despair and losing Jesus, you know? Well, absolutely. And we think of Jerusalem now in a really elevated way, and we should, but back in that day, it wasn't. Right. It was kind of a place that the Roman Empire sent some generals who are a little tougher because it was they were a tough group to navigate right, and yet right. God chooses yes. to use whomever he chooses yeah. for his will and that includes all of us. That's right. And you know, we are instructed in scripture to pray for Israel. Yes. And we have a resource, 10 ways you can pray for Israel and it's free, it's for you, 18557590700. And uh, this is the Lord's heart that we pray for peace in Israel. Well, up next, guest teacher Adam Shepsky shares how to be a good Samaritan today.
So right after Jesus sent 70 disciples out, it was the biggest missions push of that time. This lawyer comes and asks him and says like, Lord, like who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells this incredible story, this parable, but actually had real historic significance. And, and the story was the Good Samaritan. And in this story, there's a man who went on a journey and was actually attacked and left half dead on the side of the road. And both a priest and a Levite walk past him and actually walk past on the other side because they didn't want to infringe on their religious traditions. And then this Samaritan comes rocking up and he sees the man there and he ends up taking the man and, and he had oil and he had wine. He put the man on his donkey, bandages his wounds, and then took him to an inn where he stayed for the night with the man. And it says that the next day, he, he said to the innkeeper, like, if this man needs anything else covered, if there's any other expenses, I'll come back and I'll pay those. And Jesus makes a very interesting point here. It says that this road was on the way from Jerusalem to Jericho, which historically at the time was known as the way of blood. It was actually known for, for crime. If you were to travel there alone, there was a high probability of you being harmed. And now you have a man traveling alone on his donkey with a first century first aid kit, along with bandages, oil, and wine to actually heal wounds. It was like he was traveling that way of blood intentionally, potentially looking for people who were left for dead. He clearly had a relationship with the innkeeper who he paid to have this man, the, the hurt man, stay in that inn and had every intention to come back should that man have incurred extra expenses. So when Jesus finishes this parable, again, talking to the lawyer, he says like, hey, so who was the neighbor? And the lawyer says, well, the Samaritan was. And Jesus says to him, so go and do the same. So what we discover using the Good Samaritan parable as the example is love is purposeful and it's intentional. In the context of Jesus sending 70 disciples to go share the gospel, what we're seeing is that a disciple of Jesus intentionally loves, intentionally gives themselves for the sake of another and actually does this on purpose. I'm actually intentionally looking for places of blood and I'm actually going there intentionally because I know I have a first aid kit. I know that the gospel can actually bind up a broken heart. It actually can remove the old sin nature. It actually can heal a body. So in Romans 5, it actually says that the Holy Spirit, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. And love doesn't mind being uncomfortable. And when we love, we will purposely seek those places. The, the farthest, darkest corner of our community, our family, our, our city, we will go there because we know that the love of God that's been poured out in us, if, if it could be poured out in us, it definitely can be poured out there. So we don't have to fear being uncomfortable. We don't have to fear what people might say because we know that when we're moved and compelled by love, that the fruit of the gospel, the transforming power of God will actually become evident and manifest every place we go. Well, I think Adam Shepsky just hit it right on the head. The love of Christ compels us. I mean, that is the motivation, the reason why we share the good news here at 700 Club Canada and why we would share it in our lives, in our everyday lives, because we actually love people. We actually believe that the gospel works, that it heals, that it saves, that it restores. Do you believe that? If you do, then would you please partner with us so that together we can reach more people with the good news of Jesus. For a one-time uh, gift today, you can play a role in the mission of what we're doing together and we'll send you the oracles of God, the story of the Old Testament. It's a breathtaking journey of Brack, the story of God's word. Watch this, it's amazing. 
Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all of the nations and given us his Torah. From CBN Films. The Bible is a book that has transformed the world. If you believe in the providence of God, you believe that God guided those who collected the oral and written traditions. If you can't rely on his history, how can you rely on his theology? What is it? I don't know. I thought you could tell me whether or not they're genuine. It has been criticized, it has been banned, it has been burned, its followers have been burned and killed. It mattered to them to get it right. From the makers of In Our Hands, Oracles of God, the story of the Old Testament. Available on instant 4K streaming access and DVD today for a gift of any dollar amount. Lori, we've had a great week. Uh, we started the week uh, with Dr. Carolyn Leaf learning about how to navigate our mind. We celebrated Superbook and today Israel. And I want to remind you that if you missed any of those segments, you can catch us on YouTube anytime at your right. convenience. That's what makes it so great. Um, and we're on YouTube channels. Uh, find us, just 700 Club Canada, and we'll be there. That's right. And what's neat about Superbook, like you say, is 24 hours, seven days a week. You can go back. You can follow shows that you've missed, right? You can even pick up uh, the, inter the, the interviews. That's the word I'm looking for. That's right. The uh, separate interview segments are there. So it's really, uh, it's a great way to, to be part of our family. Yeah, just our way of encouraging you uh, in your daily walk with Christ. So thank you for letting us be a part of your life, being in your home. Uh, however you're watching this, listening to this, thank you so much. We really do appreciate you and wish God's very best in your life. And we thank you for the comments. Diane, you said thank you so much for all of your team's prayers. I love all the miracles shared on your show. Thank you for all the CDs, books, and bookmarks as well. Well, thank you for being a part of our family. Yeah, and Costas, you said, I watch the 700 Club Canada daily on your YouTube channel. There it is. There it is. And the Lord is really ministering to me and blessing me abundantly. Thank you so very much, and may God richly bless you and your ministry. Well, thanks for that encouragement. It's really great, and I love the interactiveness on social media so well, you know follow us on social media through instagram or facebook because it's very interactive yeah and there's so much con so much negative content it's good to know that you can get good content yeah our power verse today is found in first john 4 7 where it says dear friends let us love one another for love comes from god everyone who loves has been born of god and knows god that's true you know that's a great that's very important good way to wrap up our week to yes. really know that God loves you, right, Bill? Yep. Love God, love others. Yep. And let God love you. Good Thanks point. for watching and enjoy your week. To contact us, visit 700club.ca.